So how do we see the nature of a city? Is it measured by the number of buildings, by their height, by the height of the stock market? Is it measured by the amount of commercial market space there is in the city? Is it measured by the number of tweets per second that rise out of the city and go into the ether? Or is there a way to see the nature of the city that supports all of these things? To look into the heart of the place and to see the nature that supports it as a living place, a, uh, something that makes all these other things possible. These two images show the same island, the island of Manhattan, 400 years apart in time. Manahata is what Manhattan looked like to Henry Hudson 400 years ago. It was a place with over 1,000 species, 55 different ecosystems, 66 miles of streams. And it's been replaced by another version of the same place, the heart of New York City, Manhattan Island, a place of 1.65 million people, one of the largest and most innovative economies in the world, a place that the whole world looks for, for culture and innovation, um, and a place that's completely dependent, as Manahata was, on the world around it. Um, how are we going to make cities that last in the future? Whether you think it's a good idea or a bad idea that Manahata has become Manhattan, either way, we are all complicit in creating a future um, that's, democ that's democratic, that's creative, and that's shared that's going to last for a long time. So I'm going to talk about three ways that the city has changed over time, and then talk about a, a new mechanism for us all to share in imagining the future. So one thing we can say about the transition from Manahata to Manhattan is that the ecosystems have changed. They've gone from forests and wetlands and beaches and an estuary to buildings and streets and parklands. And although we don't normally think of buildings and streets as ecosystems, they are. An ecosystem is a, is a place where living things and non, the non-living environment live together. That's true in a forest, if we're talking about trees and the soil and the water. And it's true for this building where we are right now. It's a, it's a non-living environment created by people, of course. And you all are living things, and you're here with me. So this is an ecosystem as well. So one of the things that happens to the process of urbanization is that the ecosystems change, and they change in dramatic numbers and scale and in variety. Something else that changes when places urbanize is the lifestyles change. These three graphs compare the consumption of an average American with an average New Yorker on a per person, per day, or per week basis. So you can see the water consumption rate, the electricity consumption rate, and the solid waste generation rate, the amount of garbage we make. And you can see they're much less for the average New Yorker. Water consumption is 74% less on a per person basis. Electricity consumption is 35% less. And waste generation is 45%. And that might seem um, counterintuitive, because we all know that the city uses a lot of water. And it uses a lot of energy. And it generates a lot of garbage, as you can see just walking down the street. But in fact, that's because there's so many people here. This idea that resource consumption in cities can be less on a per person basis is the idea behind the green metropolis hypothesis. The idea that as people move to cities, their resource consumption decreases, but their quality of life can still stay high. Because we learn to live in new ways. We live closer to each other. We use other forms of transportation. Um, we transform our lifestyles to fit the environment that we, that we find ourselves in. The third thing we can say about cities and their relationship to the environment is that the climate's changing. This is true all over the world, but it's particularly true in coastal cities like New York. And the, this, this table from the New York City panel on climate change shows um, the baseline climate, 1971 to 2000, and then predictions for 2020, 2050, and 2080. And it shows the climate getting warmer, it shows it getting wetter, and it shows the sea level coming up. So what if you could manipulate these things in virtual space to change the ecosystems of the city, to change the lifestyles of the people living in the city, and to change the climate that the city is going to experience? And then see the nature of the city. See it through measures of the water cycle, the carbon cycle, biodiversity, and population. And then see those patterns, see your vision of the future in the contrast to the way the city was as a wild place 400 years ago, the way it is today, and then to see the performance of your vision, your idea for what the future holds. This is the kind of innovation I think we need to bring to our search to make cities sustainable. 
And so my colleagues at the Wildlife Conservation Society and I created this new website called Manahata 2409. And it has this funny name because we're thinking of Manahata, we're thinking about the city as a wild place, as a place of nature, but we're also trying to stretch the imagination. You know, there were 400 years between the time Henry Hudson came to New York and 2009, and we had the 400 year anniversary. Well, what's the city gonna be 400 years from now? That's the purpose of Manahata 2409, is to, to democratize and to share the creation process of the future. When you come to the website, it's completely free. Anybody can use it. Um, you get two choices. You can create a new vision, or you can browse visions that other people have put in. Um, if you go to make a new vision, then you can give it a name. Um, you can give it a year. You don't have to imagine 400 years from now. You can imagine next year if you like, or 10 years, or 20 years. It's kind of an interesting question. What's the time that we plan over? You can write a little description of what you would like your vision of the city of the future to do. And then you can say, where do you want to start? What ecosystems do you want to start with? Do you want to start with the city as Henry Hudson saw it? Or would you rather start with the city today? You can also start with somebody else's vision if you go the, the browse visions route. And then it brings you to a web map like this with controls on the right and on the left. And you can select a block in the city. You can select the block where you go to school or where you work or the block where you live. You can select several blocks. You can choose a neighborhood to work on. And then once you've selected your vision extent, the interface then fills it with a representation of the ecosystems there on a 10 meter scale. So about the width of this, of this uh, lecture hall here is what we're talking about. So in this representation, the, the pinks and the purples and the blues represent different building types. The yellows and the oranges are different transportation types. There's uh, types that are under the ground, these modifiers like subways running up a Broadway that you might see there is a set of dots. You can also see the ecosystems of that part of the city over top the ecosystems of 400 years ago. So it's this layered look at the city. And then you can change the ecosystems. You can create your own vision. And on the, the side are these painting tools. And so these are not just painting colors, these are painting ecosystems. These ecosystems can have different heights. Your single family house can be one story or two story or three story. Each ecosystem is described by a set of parameters that then you can investigate through the website. So you can paint single family homes or office buildings or stadiums. There's no constraint on what you can paint. This is a tool for imagination and for visualization. You can paint the ecosystems that used to be there. You can paint freshwater marshes or beaches or, or forest. You can paint different transportation modalities, highways. Uh, streets. You can adhere to the grid of the city or you can choose a different alternative form of the grid if you like. Um, you can paint green roofs and cisterns and subway lines and streetcars. All the kinds of things that are part of our, our conversation today about how we're going to make the city more sustainable in the future. So in this instance I've painted the city and I painted green roofs on three of the blocks. But I want to draw your attention to, on the other side, two other selectors. So you can also select the lifestyle of, a, of the people living in your city of the future. So you can have average New Yorkers, you can select average Americans, you can select average Earthlings, parameterized by data from the UN. You can have a Lenape person. The Lenape were the Native Americans who lived in Manhattan 400 years ago. Or you can choose this thing called eco-hipster. So eco-hipster is probably like all of you. Um, an eco-hipster is a, an average New Yorker who's making decisions to try and decrease their environmental impact by, by taking the subway more often and taking the train when they go on vacation and most importantly by choosing to get their electricity from renewable sources, which is something we all can do. You can choose the climate of the future. Do you, want to cli do you think we should plan for the climate of today or the climate of 2020 or the climate of 2050? And as you do that, it'll actually bring up a shoreline showing you the 100-year flood line of your vision, uh, your idea of the climate of the future. And then you can choose different storm events. And then the device shows you the performance of your vision. And it shows you in this multi-dimensional sort of way. It shows you measures of the water cycle, the carbon cycle, biodiversity and population. On this graph, the, the brown arrow um, on the far right at the top, that's the, that's the performance of that part of the city today. So that, that metric is stormwater drainage. And so we're estimating that those six blocks of the city today in a moderate rainstorm will produce three million gallons of water going into the stormwater system. If you paint green roofs, then you can decrease that down to two million. So that, your vision is actually more performative in that sense. 
But of course, th those six blocks 400 years ago, the water would have just gone into the ground and into the streams and flooded away. There would have been no stormwater problem, so we would need no stormwater drainage. You can also compare the greenhouse gas emissions of, of your vision. You can see painting, greenhouse, or painting green roofs gives you a, a slight improvement in the greenhouse gas emissions. Um, it doesn't help you much with species, that's the third one, and it doesn't change the population. You can also see it in terms of these input and output diagrams and in a, in a full sort of data download that you can um, bring home and plot and, and think about for education purposes as well as trying to, trying to do what we call sort of environmental preview. You know, right now most of the time um, in architects or in the city we plan a project and then it, it goes to environmental review and then maybe we make some changes to make it have less impact. What if we could imagine what a green roof would do or a bioswale at the beginning of the process? And then say you got an idea that was really great, an idea that nobody had thought of for your block, an idea that you wanted to share with everybody else. Then you can go into the device and you can mark your vision public. And then everybody can see it in this carousel. So I'll just show you a couple example visions that I've created just to give you an idea of the kinds of things you can do. Uh, I call this the Greening of Community Board 1 by 2080. Community Board 1 is the, is the lower part of Manhattan and it's indicated by this orange line on the slide. You can see the blue line, that's the predicted 100-year flood mark in 2080. So buildings that are outside of that blue line are places that would get flooded in a large coastal storm. Um, these are the ecosystems of that part of the city today. These are the ecosystems of that part of the city 400 years ago. And here's my vision. My vision has a, a beach along the FDR highway instead of the FDR highway and salt marshes back behind so that those places that would be flooded would be protected by what nature tells us protects us, beaches and salt marshes. You can see Battery Park City is two islands. In this, in this vision, they've been made into pedestrian islands connected by pedestrian bridges. And then to make up for some of the, the missing buildings on the edge of the island, I've increased the height of the buildings in the center part of the vision. And here's the performance. You can see it does much better on stormwater. Um, the greenhouse gas emissions are about half of what they are today in 2080. The species diversity is increased by 50 percent. And the, and the number of jobs is actually more than it is today, according to the model. Right? So it goes from 200,000 jobs to about 250,000 jobs in Community Board 1. So this isn't a vision of taking apart the city or returning it to, to, to some previous place. It's actually trying to take the performance of nature and use it to try and drive our imagination toward um, more creative and more sustainable solutions. Here's another example for 14th Street. Um, here's 14th Street. Um, here are the ecosystems of 14th Street uh, today. Um, and here's my vision of the future. So this is based on a, a book I wrote called Terra Nova. And in Terra Nova, I write a lot about how different kinds of transportation that are based on electricity could be much more effective and more sustainable. So in this case, 14th Street doesn't have, a, doesn't have cars anymore. It has a light rail going right down the middle of 14th Street. And every other block, it's meeting streetcar lines. And then on top of all the buildings, there's photovoltaic panels that are creating electricity. There's a, um, a windmill, uh, a wind farm along the East River collecting some of the winds and creating energy. Um, and the whole goal here is to try and find a configuration of the city that would have less greenhouse gas emissions. And in fact, this, our models are predicting a 93% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. Oh, I should have said there's one other thing about 14th Street, is that eco-hipsters live there. Right? Because if you have eco-hipsters that are taking the subway and riding on the light rail, and those light rails in that subway get the electricity from wind power and solar power, then there is no carbon involved. There's no fossil fuel being burnt in order to, to make that vision, to make that happen. And so you can see a dramatic reduction in the amount of greenhouse gas emissions. So what's the audience for this? I like to say it's for the, the skeptical and the intrepid and the imaginative to all work together to try and imagine the city of the future. We call these people vision makers. And I think actually this is at the cutting edge of our imaginations. We've been so creative in building our economy, in building our culture, in writing music, and even in doing science. But where are we going to take all that information, all that passion, all that energy, all that creativity, all that knowledge, and actually commit it to making a world that's going to last? Because we know that we have huge problems that are undermining not only our ecology, but our economy. And so cities are a huge part of that solution, and cities need to bring their kind of creative force to that, to that question 
of making visions of the future, making visions that are shared and sustainable and lasting. And that's true not just for New York, but other cities around the world, old cities and new cities, and for wild places all over the world. So I hope you'll check it out, manahata2409.org. Thank you very much.